Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Once again, space fans from all over America and indeed the world were flocking to Boca Chica to watch the ninth flight of Starship and Super Heavy. Yeah, this program's flight test started out with Hopper back in 2019. And interestingly enough, until today, that was the only piece of Starship-related hardware which had flown more than once. But today's flight plan called for that to change because they were going to finally reuse the booster from a previous flight. And while you can absolutely argue that the previous two flights were uh, somewhat challenged in the whole success department, the fact is the only other launch vehicle with a propulsively recovered booster that has been reused is the Falcon 9, which has also been built by SpaceX. So SpaceX are now number one and two on that. Now, if you're going to talk about recovered orbital class boosters, sure, you can argue that space shuttle boosters sort of count if you squint at them, but they were not propulsively recovered. And even then, that was a capability that took a long time to demonstrate and then even longer to perfect. Now, today, the flight was stacked. We went through our countdown. There was a couple of holds at T minus 40 seconds due to a ground service infrastructure that was causing some issues. But uh, they decided to just go for it and see if it would trip again at the 10 second mark. It did not. Everything counted down. We got a new... Well, user interface, which honestly I'm not a big fan of, but yeah, we got through our launch. And yeah, incidentally, the launch was looking a little more spectacular today because Twitter finally supports 4K resolution, meaning that it's, you know, caught up with YouTube as of 10 years ago. And so with the aid of all those extra pixels, we were much better able to appreciate the pressure waves traveling through that cloud of dust. There is something very special about the fact that the rocket is so loud that we are able to see the sound waves that it is generating. But importantly, the fact that they had got off the pad with this booster, with all the engines lit even, was the first big success of this flight, showing that they could in fact refly a booster. We knew this booster would not get reflown again because they had plans for it. They were going to push its flight envelope out a little more. Now, we should also take a moment to look at the UI at the bottom of the screen. If you look, you can see the sort of familiar attitude indicator in the bottom left and then the engine indicator also next to that but you'll notice a line running around the outside that is the propellant display which as you'll see is going counterclockwise as it slowly uh, depletes the fuel on board now as it accelerated upwards it got through max q and there's a you know, hint of some atmospherics but that's really it for ascent and then looking down from the booster you can just see it casting a bit of a shadow into the gulf this launch was late in the afternoon again, so uh, the sun is relatively low on the horizon and therefore it casts a shadow out into the gulf because of the, you know, the plume that it is left behind. Now also we have a camera on Starship here and you can see another variation on the tiling pattern now. Notice the black ablative material that's been laid out. This is instead of the previous version that had sort of like a, a glass wool material in there. Elon had a whole conversation with Tim Dodd just beforehand and he made it clear that this mission was really all about the heat shield system, or at least that was the plan prior to the launch. In fact, prior to the launch, there was a plan for uh, Elon to give a whole update on the whole Starship to Mars program, which uh, he decided to shift till after the successful flight. And as of right now, I don't believe it has been given. I was wondering whether it would be like uh, Nixon with his speeches for Apollo 11, where they had the contingency speech just in case, like, everyone died. Also, look in the top left, see the cloud layer casting the shadow over the surface? That's pretty neat. You'll also notice that the vehicle rolled 90 degrees just before stage separation. So, yeah, we're about to see the engine start their shutdown sequence. You know, carefully adjusting the flow, not shutting them down too quickly. And then you'll notice that it's going to pitch up over the top here as it begins its boost back. So this booster, a reused booster, has successfully lofted its payload and performed its uh, flip and boost back. So that is an undeniable success for this mission. For this booster, this is going to be at the high point. And from this point, well, you know, it's all downhill, as they say. And many would argue for the mission in general, this was the high point 
and it's all downhill. I mean, to be fair, however, the second stage is supposed to achieve uh, orbital velocity. It's supposed to reach second engine cutout because the previous two flights of the V2 Starship did not. But since the V1 Starship achieved second engine cutout, it's, you know, it's not such a big deal as actually flying a reused booster. And so, yeah, we had a successful uh, boost back. Engines have shut down, but I can't tell you, unlike the previous missions, I can't tell you how far it boosted back because now there is no booster telemetry. There's nothing telling us the altitude or velocity. We are guessing at how fast it was going, which for nerds like me is kind of annoying because this was the one that we're going to actually demonstrate a more aggressive angle of attack. That meant that we're going to turn it into the airstream at a higher angle and hopefully demonstrate more cross-range capability using the, the chines to you know uh, deflect the, um, the descent. Now, having finished the boost back, it now continues to dump uh, propellant. It's actually dumping excess oxygen to reduce the vehicle mass to minimize the amount of mass that is going to be, you know, have to be decelerated during the landing. Meanwhile, looking at Starship, we've got these great views from the engine bay and quite a few of those angles look like we might in fact have some leaks going on. If we skip it forward a few minutes, you look at the top left, that definitely looks like something exhausting into the space. You can see that it looks like a jet as the spacecraft turns and the illumination changes. You see the base of the jet getting better defined. So I'm not sure that's supposed to be there. I would guess it isn't, but you can never quite be sure because there are legitimate reasons to have like gas venting from various locations. Anyway, we cut back to this camera and I'm just going to loop it for a second. So now we are looking straight at the sun and just appreciate that the sun is brighter than the rocket exhaust from all those engines there. However, that little thing that we think is a leak, that is visible. How is it that the sun is outshining rocket exhaust and yet we can see that little leak? And I think that leak basically has liquid in it. It's got tiny droplets and those are you're scattering the light. That's why we can see it over the hot, you know, exhausts. Anyway, the booster is coming in hot and watch the asymmetric heating on that engine bay, probably because it's coming down at a high angle of attack. This visible heating in the engines uh, starts around, you know, 15 kilometers. Uh, and so that gives us an idea of how high it is. The next thing to look for is when we see the um, the vapor cones. That was typically around 10 kilometers on the way up. So that's roughly how high it is. And as it's getting lower and lower, uh, the, the image becomes a lot less distinct. This camera is on shore and it's looking through more and more haze. So we barely see it when engine ignition happens there. And then moments later, the entire booster just explodes. Now I noticed that we get a moment of telemetry that showed one engine not working. It's possible that that engine precipitated the entire booster failure, but it's also possible that something else was involved. Still, I hope the SpaceX engineers learned something about the dynamics of the booster under those extreme conditions, because that will make the mission worth a, a whole lot more. As it stands, the next goal that they were going for was to get the second stage up through Seco, second engine cutout, and a successful injection into their planned suborbital trajectory. Uh, notice the uh, Raptor vac on the left has a little hot spot on the left, and if you look just above it when the engine cuts out, uh, you'll see another hot spot that forms on the skirt wall here. So like initially they shut down the Raptor vacuum engines and then they shut down the sea levels. And then we get this really bright hot spot there. I don't know what that is, but this, well, this is the high point for the Starship because at this point, everything else starts going downhill or rather it starts going in circles. You see, it becomes pretty obvious right about now that the vehicle is starting to rotate off axis and it has attitude control systems that are going to try and counteract this. But the Starship is basically picking up a spin. Now, initially, I wasn't sure whether this was an anomaly or not, because at this point in the flight, they're basically uh, you know, dumping propellant, they're purging lines, venting stuff. And so picking up some rotation may be not entirely unexpected, but it just doesn't stop. Now, notice that vent, by the way, right in the center there that seems to be pretty persistent. I, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how normal that is, but 
understand that it's actually not the one that's pushing the vehicle in the, the into the spin because it's on the wrong side. Also note the shadows moving across the structure just to show you how fast the vehicle is rotating in orbit. At this point, they're 10 minutes after launch and Starship is headed out over the Atlantic. So as far as I can tell, the official word is that there were fuel leaks that resulted after engine shutdown and the fuel was venting in a fashion, an asymmetric fashion that would spin up the booster. Now, the uh, attitude control system uses ullage gas. That means it's the gas in the space above the propellant. So as the propellant is you know, uh, consumed, you need to fill the space above the propellant with uh, pressure, you know, pressurized gas. So you'd basically um, boil off some of the gas and re-inject it in there, and that helps you uh, maintain pressure so that your fuel does, doesn't get uh, sucked back out of the propellant lines. So that is a reserve of energetic high-pressure gas that can be used to do perform attitude control. But if you've got a leak in your system, then you're going to run out of that capability. And I think that's what happened on this flight. So you'll see that it is rotating in a longitudinal manner, right? That's rotating end over end. It's rather, rather than rolling, it is rolling end over end, which it really shouldn't be doing. I really like this moment where we see the spacecraft casting a shadow into the gases that are being dumped. That's always a really cool look in space, casting shadows on clouds in orbit. But yeah, one of the problems with rotating end over end is it moves the propellant towards the ends of the vehicle, which isn't necessarily where you want it if you want to relight your engines. And that is going to be part of this test flight. Or rather, it was part of this test flight plan because they need to be able to demonstrate that they can relight the engine reliably in orbit so that after they launch this 100 ton spacecraft into orbit, they can then deorbit it exactly where they need it and not have it randomly deorbit somewhere on the Earth where uh, you know someone could get injured. Anyway, skipping forward, we do get to look inside the top of the spacecraft. Uh, a lot of stuff floating around here. I think it's probably ice, but what I want you to notice is that all of these pieces are moving in roughly the same direction as uh, the spacecraft rotates. And in other shots, you'll see the, the motion changes indicating that the spacecraft is tumbling. Anyway, uh, this is another view from inside the spacecraft looking at the side of the PEZ dispenser. And right in the middle there, you can probably see where the door should be. They were planning to test opening and deploying the door and deploying satellites. And these were, of course, supposed to slide down one at a time and then slide out through that tiny little door. You can see like chains on the left for moving things. And on the right, you can see the black structure of a COPV, a pressure vessel. And then this whole thing rides on a series of vertical rails that allows the satellites to slip down one at a time before being propelled out the side of the spacecraft. This was the deployment mechanism they want to use for the V2 Starlings. Again, this is it viewing from above. You can see the vertical rails running up the side and the horizontal rails the satellites will run on as they're being ejected. And then uh, above that, there is a door. Now, the problem is the door ends up not working. Uh, also, again, look at the way those particles are moving and seeing how they're changing direction. So not only is the thing pitching end over end, but it is rolling. And this is these things are moving uh, in roughly the same direction because of the Coriolis effect. So what we are seeing here is an indication of how the spacecraft is tumbling, even although we're looking at it from the inside, right? This is you know, this is classic science here, how you can tell that a, a space is rotating by looking at the way things move inside it. So anyway, long story short, uh, the door fails to open and we've had problems with the door on the previous missions. We haven't actually tested it in many cases. They went back to the drawing board, I guess, and made some changes. Like, and we're not clear just how much air is in this, for example. Is there uh, any residual atmosphere in this that is pushing the door shut? Is there something that is frozen, that has jammed the mechanism? We don't know. This is quite a complicated system. Like the space shuttle, I don't know if you know, the space shuttle had to have like vents in the side so that as it's launching, the air flows out through these vents in the payload bay and they would have to be able to close these during uh, descent and landing and then open them 
as they got deeper into the atmosphere. It was quite a complicated thing to solve, is like equalising the pressure of these payload bays. I mean, I think we should sort of step back for a second and realise that you know, SpaceX engineers have built the Raptor engine, which is undeniably a 21st century engine that pushes the limits beyond the state of the art elsewhere. And yet, engineers at SpaceX are also struggling to build a door that works reliably. Engineering is complicated in ways that we lay people frequently do not appreciate. And engineering for spaceflight frequently involves conditions which you cannot simulate until you've actually put your hardware up in space. So anyway, with the vehicle spinning out of control, they didn't attempt an engine relight, and uh, there was no way for them to control the vehicle into an attitude which would let it survive re-entry. So uh, basically, towards the end of the flight, all we did was sit and watch the show as this thing burned up, thanks to uh, the power and clarity of Starlink and 4K video coming from Twitter. So again, we've got one of these flights, some people can definitely say this bit was a success, other people can say this bit was definitely a failure, and depending upon what your opinion is, you can cast this flight as a success or a failure, but at least it didn't cause hundreds of flights to have to get diverted this time. They weren't getting in the way of other people that were minding their own business. This was just SpaceX that would have liked this test to be a success, but unfortunately... Uh, it was less successful than they hoped. And so I don't doubt there's a whole bunch of media already saying SpaceX failed terribly and a whole bunch of other media saying SpaceX reuse booster. And the truth is the success is sort of in the middle and more work is needed. If this were a government run operation that was entirely funded by taxpayer dollars, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if there were be hearings before Congress and stuff. As it is, I think Elon is sort of simu uh, you know, insulated from that because of the, a lot of the money for development is coming from things like Starlink money and in investments. So yeah, he can keep throwing his money into the sky and exploding it if he wants to. Uh, I'm sure we're going to see another flight trying to replicate uh, the goals that were set out for Flight 7. Maybe they will do it on Flight 10. I don't think there's any fundamental physical reason why you can't build a fully reusable launch vehicle. Uh, the only thing I see is engineering problems and uh, money as being the primary barrier to such an endeavour. And clearly SpaceX is not backing down from the challenge anytime soon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.